Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jill Featherstone and I'm the Director of Education with the Des Moines Art Center and I'm really thrilled that you're here with us and zooming with us as we the new word probably added to the dictionary today um, because you are in for such a treat. Um, as has been touted before as like a silver lining of the pandemic, we've learned that we can host speakers from various locations. And if you were with us a couple of weeks ago, we had a speaker from Cambridge and now we have a speaker, not from such a far distance, but it's certainly easier on the speakers to be able to join us by Zoom than having to travel all of these places. So I, I hope that you all enjoy seeing some lectures on Zoom because it, it sure is opening up the world of um, education and interpretation for museum um, aficionados. So thank you very much for being on today. Um, so tonight I'm going to introduce Laura Burkhalter and Rita Berg. And many of you probably know Laura very well. Laura joined the Art Center in 1999 as curatorial assistant and has been steadily promoted into her current role as curatorial manager. From 2005 to 2016, Laura also served as the docent lecturer for the Art Center's Museum Education Department. She has curated numerous permanent collections, uh, permanent collection exhibitions from themes as diverse as bedecked, costume and coiffure to exploring how, or which explored how artists used adornment of the body and also um, her exhibition, Bad Dreams, which you might remember, which brought together images of the dark corners of the sleeping subconscious. So Laura, aren't you happy that I pulled out those two exhibitions <laughs> from your past? They seem, <laughs> then, relevant to, they seem relevant to tonight. <laughs> and then also that Laura has uh, curated the major exhibitions, Alchemy, Transformations in Gold, Laurel Nakadate, the artist from um, right here in Ames, Iowa, and Transparency's Contemporary Art and History of Glass. And as I mentioned earlier, she's currently working on Justin Favela Central American, which will open on July 17th. Um, and she has been involved in nearly every Iowa artist exhibition during the year, every year of her tenure with an exception of this past year. So thank you, Laura, for being here and organizing the exhibition Goya Returns. And then our other guest tonight is Rita Berg, paintings conservator. She joined the M Midwest Art Conservation Center after completing a Crest Fellowship at the Conservation Center of New York University's Institute of Fine Arts, where she treated old master paintings from the dispersed Samuel H. Crest collection and assisted with teaching and supervision of graduate conservation students. Prior, she spent a year at the Brooklyn Museum of Art and internships at the New York Historical Society, the Cranmer Art Group in New York, the Cloisters, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and um, Mickey or Rita, will you please pronounce the museum in Vienna, Austria? <laughs> uh, the I better not do it. Mickey, you go for it. <laughs> uh, Consistoration Museum. It's, it's a very long word with a lot of consonants. I, I'm sorry, I was having um, some technical problems. Uh, what, what is it, the Kunsthistorisches? Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's way better. Thank you, and uh, I'll finish this. While specializing in old masters and panel paintings in particular, Ms. Berg has extensive experience with modern and contemporary works. She holds a Master's of Arts in Art History with an advanced certificate in conservation from the Conservation Center at New York University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Minnesota. She's a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation with a membership in the paintings specialty group. So. Thank you very much both for being here and I will unspotlight myself and turn it over to Laura. Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to be a bit brief tonight. I think you're all here to hear about conservation because it's not something that we get to talk about very often and I get to talk about our history quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to uh, start with just kind of a cliff Notes version of Goya um, and talk a little bit about the content of the painting and the content of the exhibition that we have that I hope that you will come see in person now that we're more opened up and then I'll turn it over to Rita. Okay, so this is a self-portrait of Goya. So it's always good to see an artist's face. We're used to dealing with contemporary where we can introduce you to him and I cannot cross the centuries, but um, Goya did paint these very, I think, sympathetic and um, unglamorous portraits of himself that I think give you a sense um, of how interested 
he was in authenticity, both sort of painting things realistically, but also psychological authenticity is a big hallmark of Goya's work. And in some ways, that's why he's considered um, the one of the forefathers of modern and contemporary art is he was really interested in um, probably what we would call in our time existentialism, but they didn't have that word back then. But Goya's work really, um, well, he worked for rich families and for the royal family, painting portraits. He also was interested in the human condition and interested in what was going on in, in his own contemporary society, whether that was um, social causes or war or what he saw as sort of hypocrisy of, of the upper and middle classes. So in many ways, a lot of the concerns that the artists that we work with with contemporary art have, and Goya really showed us what his life was like um, in Spain in the Romantic era, but in many ways, some of the things he highlighted were universal truths that are unfortunately issues that we still deal with in our world today. Um, this is a shot of the gallery um, of the wonderful newly conserved Goya painting. Um, we uh, really wanted it to be visually highlighted as well as um, educationally highlighted. So um, I worked with our installations department to find this wonderful shade of blue to match Don Prada's beautiful velvet coat um, and to make the yellow um, painting, the yellow, both the gold frame and the yellow um, of the pants and the wonderful sort of tan fur of the dog really visually um, pop out when you when you enter the gallery. When you come into the museum, if you look down the blank galleries, you'll see this painting centered in the hallway and really get a great view of it. And it's been off view for many years. So I'm really glad to um, get kind of dramatic with the way that we reintroduced it to the galleries. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is a this is a photograph actually taken before conservation. So hopefully you'll be able to um, see even between these two some of the differences. Um, but <clears throat> excuse me, Don Prada was somebody that Goya actually knew. Um, this was not a portrait of of a member of the royal family, but someone who Goya knew and actually very respected very much. Don Prada was a self made man who um, was sort of a businessman who eventually got into local politics and sort of was the equivalent of a mayor um, of Madrid. And Goya in this painting sort of pays homage to what Don Manuel's, I think, humble beginnings. You see this very simple cane chair, a piece of simple wood furniture. Um, well, he's dressed very beautifully and, and clearly very expensive clothes. He, it, it's simple too. This isn't somebody who you get the impression is um, extremely vain. Goya paints him with a very direct um, sort of intelligent gaze back at the audience. And so I think you get the sense of, of uh, that he, this is someone who he respected and saw as, as very intelligent. Also, the dog is a bit of a clue here. If you're, if you're an art history nerd like me and you're familiar with 18th century portraiture from England or France or even America at this point, often when men have their uh, portraits commissioned, they make themselves look grandiose. They, they're standing in a beautiful woods or in front of um, their house and they're wearing expensive clothes, maybe hunting gear or they, and they often, if they have dogs with them, they're, they're hunting dogs. They're very powerful animals. They're animals that talk about masculinity and talk about the sort of way these men wanted to present themselves. And what Goya presents here is this guy with his adorable pet dog who he clearly loves very much. He has his hand resting on the dog's back. Um, and if you get a look at this painting, one of the things that's always been my favorite things about this painting is that the dog's face is almost as individualized as the man's face is. If, if you knew this dog, you would recognize this painting of, of this dog. Um, we know that Goya loved animals. He includes animals in a lot of his paintings and he especially did like dogs. Um, so I, I like to think that he liked this dog as much as he liked its owner and he took the care to put that. Um, and even the, I even like the fact that the dog's like up on the table, which those of us who have pets um, know that our pets are not supposed to be on certain furniture items, but we often allow them to do so. Um, so I think, especially in this era of Zoom, um, my cat has joined many Zoom talks that I've had. So I, I love this sort of familiarity between human and animal that's in this work. I think it, it really gives it that final straw um, of sort of, this is a great individual human portrait and it says a lot about both the man in it and the artist. Um, the Art Center owns 13 prints by Goya and I'm not going to go through all 13 because we need 
time for Rita. Um, but I, I the, we have prints from each of Goya's major series of prints, and Goya was an extremely prolific printmaker, and he often used his print series to kind of work out his ideas about the world and about politics. So I'll just sort of briefly touch on the series. The first one is the Caprices, which were, um, he often used these to comment on what he saw as hypocrisies within society or sort of um, making fun of traditions or making fun of superstitions. So um, this is titled, There It Goes. And what you have here is a scary older witch teaching a young witch how to be a witch <laughs> um, and, and sort of continuing sort of this, this bad energy over generations. I mean, you can see there's a real scary cat at the top. I don't unfortunately think Goya enjoyed cats as much as he enjoyed dogs. You see a lot of terrifying cats in Goya's works. Um, this one is um, as far back as his grandfather. I think this one has a very great relevance in our world today. It's a jackass who's looking back at his family tree and it's full of jackasses. Um, I think that's sort of a joke that resonates even over all of the centuries. The next series is probably his most famous. Um, it's called The Disasters of War. We have four of these works in the collection. Um, and these are frankly can, graphic and disturbing images that still um, can be a little bit hard to look at even um, later on of the things that he saw as the Napoleonic Wars um, raged in Spain around the area Goya was living. Um, and so here you see um, a monk who has likely been stabbed or beaten and then you see soldiers carrying off the, um, the treasures of the monastery in the background sort of implying that even the church cannot protect someone from, from the horrors of war. Um, this is another one where you see the rebel soldiers who for lack of a better term, we're on Goya's home turf, but when they reach, when they get the upper hand, they they exhibit as much brutality as the Napoleonic soldiers. So Goya, it's, the title is called the same. Goya is sort of talking about war, what war does to people, and it makes everybody um, sort of into an animal. Um, the next series, Desperates or Follies, we have four of these as well. Um, these are my favorite. These are sort of nightmarish, scary images. Um, they work really well for the Bad Dreams exhibition that I curated that Jill mentioned. And these are sort of just nightmares. They often don't have um, a, a, a logical explanation. Um, and they're sort of um, scenes of scary figures, of scary faces. Here you see a giant with these kind of ghost creatures um, behind him terrorizing a man who's trying to protect himself with this shrouded figure. Um, and the giant has this very menacing look on his face and all four of the images in the show um, are very dark and scary. Um, so please go see them. Um, here's another one of a woman being abducted by a horse with these monsters in the background. It sort of looks like a landscape, but it's actually monsters faces and one of them is eating someone in the background. So a very far cry from Don Prada and his adorable little dog. Um, and then the final series, and we only have one of these, um, is a series that Goya did on the history of the bullfight. The bullfight um, is very important to the history and culture of Spain. And Goya did many images sort of starting with what he saw in this image as the origins of bullfighting. So what you see here is ancient Spaniards hunting bulls and the way that they did this led to the sport of bullfighting. And then this series ran through to contemporary, contemporary to Goya images of bullfighting. Um, so I hope that you will come see all these works in person and take a good look at Don Prada, um, especially after you hear everything Rita has for us about the detailed work that she did. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Rita. So hi, um, thank you so much for having me. So I'll be discussing the conservation treatment of your painting, um, Don Manuel Garcia de la Prada. Um, and but before we get into it, I have a lot of details of the dog, which I'm really excited to show you, <laughs> as Laura mentioned. Um, before we get into the treatment, I actually want to talk a little bit um, generally about conservation and about MAC. Uh, so MAC, or the Midwest Art Conservation Center, um, where I work as a painting conservator, is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to the long-term preservation of art and cultural artifacts. Uh, MAC is located within the Minneapolis Institute of Art in Minneapolis, and we serve um, just hundreds of museums, libraries, university collections, um, private collectors, uh, with the conservation and restoration of their cultural assets. 
Uh, we mostly work in the Midwest region, um, but recently we have been expanding as far as the East Coast, West Coast, and the South. Um, here's kind of a list of our member institutions, just to show you how many members we have across the country. And the Moyne Arts Center, of course, is one of our members. Um, I'd like to begin by clarifying what conservation is and what a conservator does. Um, conservators hold a master's degree and abide by a certain code of ethics, that is, um, and guidelines established by our field. Art conservation focuses on preservation of historical, artistic, and cultural property. We work to combine understanding of material science, historic techniques, and art history. Um, in order to make informed decisions to preserve these works of art. Um, we're often called restorers, which is not the term we prefer, to be honest. Um, unlike some restorers, we don't aim to return the work to a new state. Uh, so we're not trying to make something that's 400 or 500 years old look new. Um, our aim is to stabilize the work of art respectfully and appropriately to ensure its safety and preservation for future generations. Uh, we're often more minimalist than restorers, uh, meaning that we don't take the treatment as far as restorers do. Uh, generally speaking, we're less invasive um, and we kind of try to gain a deeper understanding of the artifact itself, um, its historical importance, its significance, and the degradation processes that took place. So I very much hope to kind of demonstrate those aspects of our conservation in the talk. Um, I should mention, and we can talk about this later in Q&A, but in order to become a restorer, you have to complete a master's degree. Um, there's about, there's I think four training programs in the US, um, New York, Delaware, uh, Buffalo, in New York State, and Queens, Canada. Um, in, even in order to apply to conservation, you have to have a background in art history, studio arts, and science, um, chemistry in particular. Um, following the program, um, there's a number of internships and fellowships that you have to complete before you kind of settle in a full-time position. So it's a really um, intense process. Uh, the schools only take a few people a year. Um, in my department, for example, in paintings, we had two people each year. It's a very small field and um, we know each other really well um, and we collaborate really closely. Uh, so in addition to treatment, uh, we have a, a variety of other services we provide to our members and private individuals. Um, any of you listening today can call us with any questions you have. Um, we receive calls for emergency assistance, um, especially with flooding instances. Um, we get calls from artists asking about materials or changing the changes that are happening to their works of art. Um, for, for example, you know, how do I varnish a work or what steps do I need to take if I have an infestation? Um, it's part of our mission as a nonprofit organization to provide those services to the public or, you know, anyone who who wants to call in. Um, we also conduct workshops. So um, on the left there, you see an example of salvage after a flood workshop. We do collection surveys as well, where a conservators, conservator goes to a museum and kind of assesses the needs of a full collection. So looking at light levels, humidity, um, environmental conditions, and then making recommendations um, for that organization on how to proceed. Uh, we have four specialties within our organization. So paper conservation, which includes drawings, prints, uh, photographs, pretty much anything on the paper substrate. Objects, um, which is pretty much anything you can think of, um, glass, marble, um, metals, baskets, um, pretty much any material, wide, really wide variety. Um, textiles and paintings. Um, this is the paintings lab, which you also see behind me here. Um, in this picture, you kind of see a part of it and some of the equipment we have, um, including, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Can you see my pointer if I do this? Right. You can. Um, so these are the extraction uh, trunks for vapors uh, from solvents that we commonly use um, to keep us safe. 
we also, which is not shown in this uh, picture, we have a spray booth uh, with an air extraction system, which allows us to use rather harsh chemicals when necessary in a safer way. Uh, and we can also use that to varnish paintings. Um, you see a microscope there in the back and the stable right here in the center, uh, which is covered <laughs> with a lot of frames and art is actually a lining table. Um, so it's a hot suction table that allows us to line a painting, which means putting another piece of fabric onto the original canvas um, to provide additional support. And this will be really important um, in terms of Goya and my talk. So we'll talk more about lining um, paintings and how that was done in the past and how it's done today. So when any object, be it a painting, frame, a drawing, um, comes into the lab, we do a full condition report and treatment proposal. Um, we look really, really closely at the structure of the painting and its condition. Now we usually start from the back, um, examine the auxiliary support, which can be a stretcher, a strainer, a panel. Um, we'll look at ground layers, paint layers, varnish layers, everything that goes into the construction of the work, um, as shown in the image in the left. We look closely under the microscope to assess flaking, uh, lifting paint, to determine what's original, what's not original. Um, I have to really stress that a lot can be told by looking very closely at the work of art. Um, I feel like these days, especially, people don't take the time uh, to really look closely. Um, that's a big, big part of our job before we proceed with any, any kind of testing. To so really try to understand the painting technique and how something was constructed. Uh, we also consult with curators and stewards of collections to learn as much as possible in order to make important treatment decisions. Um, if a painting comes to us, I can propose the treatment to a curator, um, but a lot of the time there's a conversation involved. Um, curators, stewards of collections, uh, may be coming to um, looking at the painting from a different perspective, maybe from more of an art historical perspective, while I'm coming from a material science part of it. So bringing the two sides together is very, very important um, in order to determine treatment. We also have a number of analytical techniques um, available for examination. Ultraviolet light illumination allows us to look at varnishes and previous retouchings or in-painting campaigns that um, have been done in the past. So here in this image, for example, um, in the UV image, you see uh, previous adhesives or glues that have been used to put the pieces, broken pieces together. You see certain coatings that have been applied to this sculpture that fluoresce this kind of yellow color. Uh, it's a very useful non-destructive technique. We recently acquired an infrared camera that allows us to look at under drawings and paintings. Uh, this is a technology that can penetrate through the paint layers to look at the first drawings of the artist. So the drawing that the artist would make before applying the paint onto the canvas. Um, that's not all the, always the case. Um, you know, some painters, of course, paint directly onto the canvas, but especially earlier on with old masters, the design would be sketched out uh, before paint application. Um, we can learn a lot about how the drawing was created, what materials were, were used, um, was the drawing done freehand or was it copied from a different, um, you know, drawing on paper, for example. In this image, and you have to look closely, you see all of these lines and this kind of hatching um, right here, which is the un under drawing that was done freehand. Here, on the other hand, and I hope you can see it, but there is a grid of lines right here. I'm kind of going. That was used to transfer the design. So the design was probably laid out or drawn out before by a master in a workshop and then transferred onto a panel. Um, and apprentices would proceed with painting. So these are kind of bits of information that are really interesting that we can gain and contribute. Um, 
to art historical research. Um, let's see, where am I? X-ray fluorescence is another non-destructive anal analytical technique uh, that we can use. It provides information on the elemental composition of top paint layers, which can help us determine which pigments were used by the artist. Um, so we can look at the elements and we can kind of figure out, often combined with other techniques, which pigments were used. This can help with dating and also establishing if something is authentic or not. So if I find a pigment that was used in the 19th century that, or that, that wasn't found until, until the 19th century, but the painting is dated to the 17th century, then we may have some kind of problem. We also have access to x-ray when that's necessary, and we conduct numerous, numerous tests. Um, solvent tests with different chemicals to determine you know, the paint, the varnish and paint solubilities, um, if the overpaint comes off um, without affecting the original. So basically the best cleaning system for that particular work of art. So that's kind of exactly what happened when your painting uh, came to our lab. Uh, we went through those steps and looked really, really closely first. Just as a reminder, um, the various layers of the painting, starting from the back, so you have the auxiliary support, which is the stretcher in this case. Um, you have the fabric, the original canvas and the lining fabric. Uh, you have your ground layers and priming layers, paint layers and varnish layers, as, long, as well as retouching. So we always start by looking at the back. Uh, this painting arrived with a backing board, which you don't see here. Um, and a backing board can be a piece of blue board or foam board um, that serves to protect the painting from accumulation of dust in the back and possible mechanical damage when it's handled. So even if a painting comes from a museum environment, having a backing board is incredibly important. Um, no matter how good your filtration system is, uh, there's still going to be an accumulation of dust um, that traps moisture in the back of your painting. So for those of you at home, if you have paintings that you really care about, um, I would recommend making sure there's a backing board on the back. Um, I hope this is not too elementary, but just wanna go through um, the terminology. This is a, a stretcher, it's an expansion, mechanical expansion stretcher, which means that we can adjust the tension of the canvas by, um, kind of tensioning this metal element. So if the tension of the canvas is slack, um, rather than, you know, kind of tight, um, we can move these elements, expand the stretcher, and adjust the canvas tension appropriately. One interesting thing um, about this painting and about the reverse was, was this lighter strip um, that we saw once we removed the backing board. Uh, we'll see later that there's a really large damage on the front, a really large horizontal damage. The painting was either folded um, or maybe it was partially cut or damaged um, on the front. So this additional um, piece of really rigid um, paperboard was adhered on with a wax resin adhesive, something we didn't ex expect to see. Uh, what we were worried about here is the rigid edges coming through to the front of the painting as shown in the image here. Uh, so over time that can create a lot of cracks um, and you can basically see the type of shape uh, show up on the front in the center of your painting. Another thing I should mention about the back and we'll get to the front, but the backs are also very important is that fabric that you see is actually not an original canvas. It's a lining fabric. So it's a secondary fabric that was adhered in this case with wax um, to kind of provide more support to the painting. So linings um, of paintings were really popular during the 60s, 70s, and even 80s in this country as a way to kind of stabilize canvases. It was believed that the painting support itself was too fragile and would deteriorate really quickly. So everything was lined, um, whether 
things needed to be aligned or not, canvases were aligned prophylactically. Um, this particular uh, lining was done using a wax resin adhesive. So imagine taking a lot of hot wax, pouring it on the back of your painting, applying another canvas, and using a hot iron to kind of um, ensure, ensure that adhesion. Um, you're using a lot of heat, you're using a lot of pressure. Um, that has caused a lot of damage to paintings in the past, um, especially paintings with impasto or um, you know, brush strokes, really visible brush strokes that were flattened during that process. Uh, the wax also tends to go um, into the structure of the paint itself and it's really hard to get out. On the right, what you see here is a lining removal uh, that I recently did for Mia, for a painting at Mia, um, which uses, again, heat um, and very careful kind of like removal of that fabric. It revealed, this was an interesting treatment because it revealed um, another painting on the back that they're gonna display um, kind of front and back now. Um, in the case of Goya, we found that the lining was really stable. There was no delamination. Um, we decided not to put the, the painting through this rather stressful process of taking, of taking off the lining. Um, just wanted to share another common recipe that was used for lining paintings in the past. Um, it's a glue-based adhesive, uh, which called for a natural resin glue rabbit skin glue, for example, flour, water, honey. It really sounds like a, like, like a cooking recipe. Um, needless to say, this is something we don't use these days. Um, it had a lot of problems with degradation, becoming brittle, and also pest infestation. So think of all of the yummy components, all of the you know, flour and honey that went into the painting that insects, even in the museum environment, were really drawn to. Um, when these kind of linings are causing damage, they're often removed. And on the right, I'm showing you a process of that removal, which is conducted mechanically with a scalpel, um, just very, very carefully going into the brittle brew, uh, glue and removing strips of non-original linen little by little. Um, once again, this causes a lot of stress to the painting and often conservators opt to stabilize the, the old linings rather than reverse them. So here's the back before and after. Um, we just, we decided to keep the lining in, uh, choosing the more minimalist approach, but remove the element that would cause damage to the, to the front. So once the back is examined, we looked at the front of the painting, uh, the ground, uh, the paint layer, the varnish layer, and all of the grime in between. One of the analytical techniques we attempted, um, but were unsuccessful with, was infrared reflectography, um, which is used to look for underdrawings, as I mentioned before. Weiss painting's technique, as Laura mentioned, is very immediate. Um, he paints wet into wet uh, really quickly. He has a lot of these kind of gestural brush strokes. So we didn't necessarily um, expect to find an un underdrawing, but we were hoping for some compositional changes, um, which unfortunately we didn't see. So after uh, looking at the ground, looking for underdrawings, looking at the paint layers, assessing their stability, um, we looked at the varnish. And I think this was kind of the main part of this treatment was the removal of the varnish layer. Uh, varnish, for those of you that are unfamiliar with this term, is a transparent coating of natural or synthetic resin, which is dissolved in the solvent. Uh, traditionally, varnishes were natural resins, such as the mar or mastic. Um, not all paintings were varnished, of course, and some paintings are partially varnished. Uh, if present, the varnish has both aesthetic and protective functions. It saturates the colors, revealing the depth, hue, and subtle details in the design. 
it produces the desired surface gloss. It saturates the colors. Um, and it also serves you know, as a minor protection for some abrasion, dirt, grime, pollution. Um, unfortunately, many varnishes that were used by artists in the past tend to discolor. They really tend to yellow. Um, you can see that in the example on the lower left where the varnish is partially removed. So here's clean area, and this is the natural resin varnish that has discolored over time. Um, that yellowing um, or kind of degradation of the var uh, varnish will really change the appearance of the painting. Uh, for this reason, after careful examination and after testing, um, servitors often remove the old varnishes and resurface the paintings with newer synthetic varnishes that will not discolor um, and will not change over time. Um, we're lucky today with advances in chemistry, uh, the varnishes that we do use will remain soluble, meaning that, and reversible, meaning that they can be removed again you know, in 100 or 200 years if additional work needs to be done. Um, so prior to cleaning tests, um, prior to testing how the varnish can be removed safely without affecting the paint layers, um, we looked at the painting under ultraviolet light illumination. So uh, the fluorescence of different coatings can give us an idea of what coating that is. Um, by fluorescence, I mean this kind of, I'm not sure how you see it on your screen, but greenish, bluish, sometimes yellowish um, fluorescence can give us an idea whether it's a natural resin or synthetic resin varnish. Here's a kind of spot that I've partially cleaned already. So it appears darker. It doesn't have that kind of fluorescence. Um, examination under UV can also reveal previous retouching. Um, even though that was visible in normal light, but right here, um, purple, kind of more purple or darker blue areas are areas that have been previously retouched. There's a tear that you see here. And these are some cleaning tests that I've also conducted earlier. Here's another detail where you can see it very clearly. Um, and this painting had numerous varnish layers. Um, often in the past, when paintings were cleaned, not everything was removed. So lighter kind of passages of composition, especially along the edges, have older, more yellowed varnishes. Um, and then this in painting that kind of extends over the damage and over the tear. Um, so, only after looking really closely and examining that um, do we proceed with cleaning. Um, there are several kind of cleaning tests on this image that you already see right here. One on the side, one here, one here, and right here as well. Um, so it's really important to test numerous areas of the composition because different colors can react in different ways. Um, you know, you might find a good cleaning solution in one area that will not work in another area. Uh, for example, uh, if you were gonna bring a painting to our lab, our cleaning tests usually would be really, really small. You would not be able to see them. Uh, we would usually conduct them on, on a side of a painting, uh, just to kind of determine how long it would take us to clean something and um, how easily the cleaning is gonna go. With something this large, it's really important to open up larger windows to really understand, um, you know, how it's going to look after um, to assess those different areas of the composition and to see how easily that overpaint, which we saw, you know, especially with this damage, how easily that's going to come off. Um, here you have our solvent test kit. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of chemistry that goes. Um, into <laughs> art conservation. Um, even before applying to graduate school, I think you have to have several uh, requirements, several courses in organic chemistry. And that is something I feel like we're learning as um, 
as the field is changing, as kind of more cleaning solutions are being developed, we're constantly educating ourselves, um, you know, on the chemistry, on the solvents or solutions that are being used. Um, here's an image of a swab, a little swab. So even for a painting of this size, uh, we would use a little cotton swab for cleaning in order to proceed kind of carefully uh, in a very controlled mat manner. Uh, if there's a grime layer, I would remove the grime layer first with the solution, um, then find an appropriate solvent to remove the varnish layer, uh, then maybe remove the underlying grime layer again. Um, it takes, you know, many, many hours, especially with cleaning. And one crucial point to always keep in mind is with cleaning, once it comes off, you really can't put it back on. So you have to um, be sure in yourself, you know, you have to be sure that what you're removing is not original. Um, kind of, we talk a lot about reversibility uh, in our work. There's a lot of things that, that I can put on a painting that can be reversed and removed. But with cleaning, once you're cleaning, you know, you're never gonna be able to put it back. That's why all of those tests and all of those analytical techniques are so important. Uh, so here's a painting in a clean state uh, right here. Uh, and you can clearly see that damage, which is either a fold or um, we're not quite sure because there's the lining fabric in the back. We can't quite tell if it's a fold or um, just a cut across. Um, this kind of white and red material you see is a previous fill that we were not able to remove. Um, it was done with a um, lead um, kind of material that hardens so much and becomes insoluble in all of our solvents. Um, we're not even able to remove it mechanically. Uh, take a look at the pants. Um, I think this is a very, very important um, part here. Uh, they appear really flat, you know. If you look at other areas of composition, um, look at his coat, for example. There's highlights, um, you know, his face, the dog. There's highlights, uh, there's low lights. There's a lot of contrast. His pants appear really, really flat without much definition. Um, and this is actually due to a pigment alteration that has happened um, in the material that the artist used. Uh, so Goya appears to have used a lot of red lake, uh, which is a pigment, um, kind of like a dark uh, red pigment that has been used by many traditional artists, uh, by many old masters. And the pigment tends to fade with time, with exposure to light. So you can ma imagine all these areas having darker, um, kind of darker red elements to it to define areas of shadow that are no longer present. Uh, it's an alteration that happens that we have very, very little control of. It happens very early in the life of a painting. Um, right now in museums, we have um, lower light levels. Uh, we have filters for UV light that help protect paintings, but the damage that has happened here has, you know, it's already happened and it's not reversible. Um, Van Gogh is another example I just wanted to point out um, that used light sensitive pigments such as red lakes. Uh, as a result, for example, the roses that you see on the left appear white, where they used to be pink, and the irises appear more blue, where they used to be more purple. Uh, also, if you ever wondered why you see so many really pale ladies in some of the galleries, especially the Dutch galleries and museums, um, they again encounter the problem of red lakes. Uh, so it's a painting technique where her cheeks would have had a little more pink to them, um, but the color has been lost over time with exposure to light. Another alteration that's very important for this painting um, has to do with inherent vice. Uh, and this is perhaps my favorite quote, uh, if I ever give presentations, inherent vice is um, kind of, the definition of inherent vice is my favorite quote. It is the tendency 
in an object or material to deteriorate or self-destruct because of its intrinsic internal characteristics, including weak construction, poor quality, or unstable materials, and incompatibility of different materials within an object. So that's a mouthful, but basically saying that certain materials that the artist used um, are reacting with, with themselves, or maybe they're poor quality materials. Uh, in the image on the right here, you see this kind of white haze in the figure um, and a little bit around in the background. So this is due to incompatible materials, pigments and resins that the artist applied that are now having a chemical reaction that we really cannot stop. Um, it is something that will continue happening. Uh, we can kind of abate it at times. Um, we can, so to say, fix it for a period of time, but it will continue happening again and again and again uh, because uh, it is part of the construction of the painting. And this is something that unfortunately we have in the case of Goya with lead soap. Um, Goya is known to use red lead ground layers. Um, so when we talked about those different layers of a painting, uh, the ground layer is the primary layer that goes onto the canvas to kind of prepare it for the painting. He used a red ground, which, you know, comes through in the areas of the composition. It gives the painting a certain tonality. Um, it's a very deliberate choice on the part of the artist, but it has a lead component that over time reacts with the oil component in oil paints uh, to form these little aggregates um, that you see in the image on the right. As this metal soap kind of combine and grow and grow, uh, they protrude from the top layer, uh, top paint layer, um, pop the paint off, creating this little craters um, that you see, um, kind of little white specks. And I added that a little bit, the image on the right, this close up, but you see this tiny white specks all over the painting, um, which are these tiny little lead soaps that have come from the past. Um, again, unfortunately, this is not something that we can stop uh, as a process. I think most of what could happen has already happened given the age of the painting. Um, cleanings and previous restorations, um, including the lining, which um, kind of adds a lot of heat and a lot of pressure, were probably not helpful um, and made the condition worse in this case. Uh, but again, this is something to take into consideration, this and the feeding of red lakes. When you kind of try to imagine how the painting would have looked like when it was created. Um, how much kind of more, I don't want to say dramatic, but how much more uh, depth and color there would have been to it. Uh, so here's an image uh, during cleaning. Again, you can see all of those teeny bitty little white specks scattered around. Um, so after Cleaning, you know, after conducting all the tests, after the careful consideration, um, we focus on filling um, in preparation to in painting. So these are the compensation stages of our treatments. Uh, in this case, we don't have um, that many fills that we needed to do, partially because we could not remove the previous work that was done on the painting. So we already had a fill to work on. Uh, the fill has hardened so much that we could not shape it. Um, we could not, you know, take off. We could not scrape into it to create texture. Um, and that, unfortunately, is something that you will see in the painting, um, you know, for ages to come, unless someone can figure out how to remove that fill in the future. Um, but for filling, we have a variety of materials available. We make our own gesso. Um, we use stone fills. Um, here's a colleague using a microcrystalline pigmented wax. Um, a fill basically goes in areas of loss uh, to mimic the texture of the canvas um, or the panel. 
to kind of prepare it for the in painting stage. Um, the most exciting, at least to me, uh, part of the treatment is compensation or in painting. Um, so your painting is an oil painting and we would never use oil uh, paint to retouch on top of an oil paint. Uh, we use materials that are stable, that are reversible, that are very different from the original. Uh, we never work on top of the original paint layers, but only in areas of loss. Uh, here's a couple of examples of some of the in-painting media we use, uh, dry pigments and watercolors, um, dry medium in the synthetic uh, resin that is not going to change, that is not going to color. So if I were, for example, to use an oil paint, um, if I were gonna retouch in oil paint on top of an oil painting, um, my retouching can look really nice um, for a few years, but then it's gonna change differently from the original. Uh, it may become much darker, um, it will cross-link and it will not be reversible in the future. So five, 10 years down the line, you would see it. Let's see. Um, here's an example of a palette and some of the tools we use. Um, we do color matching by eye. So everything is, you know, matched by eye on a palette and then put on a painting. It's really hard to make new paint look old. Um, there's a lot of putting on and taking away that we do. Um, hence the scalpel that you see here. We work with, you know, really tiny brushes. Um, Kind of trying to recreate the layers of a painting. So if a painting has a red ground layer, as is the case with the Goya, I would recreate the red um, ground layer. Kind of trying to mimic the technique of the artist in order to make it be convincing uh, for the viewer, in order for you not to see um, my retouching or my areas. Um, if you think of all of those layers, again, all of those layers of a painting, and you think of how light kind of bounces, you know, goes in and bounces back from all of those layers, the ground, um, the paint layers. There's the translucency to the old paint that we're trying to recreate. So there's a lot of putting on and taking away, putting on and taking away that goes into um, retouching. Um, often working with tiny brushes, um, under magnification, uh, you know, drawing cracks, um, to kind of mimic the original. Drawing in little lead soaps when necessary to mimic the original. The last part um, of our process is varnishing. Um, so it's probably usually the final stage. Um, as I mentioned before, natural resin varnish, varnishes were used by artists but now we have a number of synthetic resin varnishes available. Uh, these will not discolor, they will not cross-link, and they will be reversible in the future. Um, they provide good saturation, um, and there's various application methods we can use, uh, be it a spray application or a brush, brush application, to find a varnish or an appearance that is appropriate for a painting of a particular time. Uh, you know, so if I'm creating a painting from the 15th century, you know, Italy versus a 19th century uh, painting, I will take into consideration um, how the artist wanted that painting to look at that time. And I will try my best uh, to come up with a varnish system that will kind of recreate that feeling or that uh, look or that, you know, type of gloss or, yeah that would be appropriate for that time period and for that painting medium. Um, so here you see the painting varnished and I hope you can tell it's really hard um, in images, but the saturation is really improved. Um, you don't have that kind of haze um, that you had um, in the before treatment images. Um, you kind of see the details and the contrast that was obscured by the poorly saturating degraded yellowed varnish. Um, the last part of the treatment is again, putting a new backing board um, to protect the painting from a, an accumulation of dust. Uh, we've had in instances where paintings 
that uh, didn't have a backing board were damaged. Uh, there's one interesting story where a drone flew in um, the front of the painting, but only because the painting had a backing board, it kind of bounced off without creating a tear. Um, so I can't stress the importance of backing boards enough for both museums and private collectors, especially if you're flying drones in the proximity of your artwork. Here's again the back. Um, not much has changed in the back um, and some details from the front. Uh, so during cleaning um, and then the after treatment. I just want to know, uh, know that it's not with conservation, you know, we're not making it perfect. We're not returning it to the original state. There's a lot of changes that already have taken place in the painting that we have to accept um, and live with and kind of recognize. There's a lot that has um, been done by previous restorations that we had to work with. So for example, the spill that I was unable to texture and really unable to replace, um, which you still kind of see um, in, the, in the painting today. So just take that into consideration um, when you're looking at it. But I think overall with the lead soaps, with the saturation, with the degraded varnish, the appearance was really greatly improved. Um, where we were able to, um, we looked really closely sometimes under the microscope and kind of pulled the shadows um, back together a little more. So if there is information that is there in the painting, we can use it, um, not to re reconstruct, but um, to kind of recreate those areas a little more. Um, and here it is uh, before, during and after treatment. There is a little more definition in his pants, though we did not want to take, you know, more liberties that we, we took. You know, we would never go ahead and completely reconstruct something like that. Um, that would be my idea of what it should look like, not Goya's idea. So we would very much try to respect the intent of the artist, um, the original kind of like view of the artist and not, um, not our intervention, if that makes sense. We will thank Rita so much. This was really, really incredible. Thank you for putting your mind to this work and saving our, our history in paint and chemistry. It's beautiful. Okay. Thank you.